From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Matthew Chekai, Managing Editor at MEI. Wednesday, November 20th marks a somber anniversary for Ukraine, 1,000 days since Russia's full-scale invasion of the country. That aggression marked the dramatic escalation in a war that began back in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and sparked a fake insurrection in Donbass. Though the Ukrainians continue to hold out with Western assistance against Russian attacks, the past two and a half years have been devastating for the country and its people. At the same time, the war has upended the broader regional strategic environment, severely undermined the reputation of the Russian military, and sharpened the transatlantic alliance's sense of purpose. Nonetheless, at the moment, momentum in this conflict appears to be in Russia's favor. What does this mean for Ukraine as it faces another winter at war? What can the U.S. and its allies do to ensure hostilities end as favorably as possible to Ukraine and in line with American strategic national interests? What is at stake for the region and the global community? Please stay tuned as we dive into these questions and more. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers. I am thrilled and honored to be joined today by two guests uniquely qualified to discuss the Russo-Ukrainian war and its broader geopolitical implications. General Philip M. Breedlove and Dr. Yulius Vina Joja. General Breedlove is a retired four star with the U.S. Air Force, a former F 16 pilot, and he served as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Europe between 2013 and 2016. Dr. Joja is a senior fellow and director of MEI's Black Sea program. Prior to this, she served as an advisor to the Romanian president and as a deputy project manager at NATO Allied Command Transformation in Virginia. Welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Matthew. Thanks for having us. Uh, we'll get into some of the details later in our conversation, but uh, first, General Breedlove, please give us a brief snapshot of the war, uh, the current military situation on the ground, on the Ukrainian home front, uh, Ukraine's relationship with its Western allies, and the state of the transatlantic alliance. So that's an awful lot. Let's just hit a few high points. Um, I'm not really sure that I agree with the way you characterize the war as you introduced it. And many do. I don't fault you. Many talk about Russia having momentum in this war. I think that Russia is gaining some ground in the East, but I'm not sure that equates to momentum. All the ground that they have gained this year is less than what Ukraine gained when it went into the Kursk region and occupied portions of Russia. So we have to keep everything in balance. Clearly, Russia is steadily advancing at the east, in the east, at great cost. Conservatives uh, estimate over 600,000 lost casualties in this war for Russia, some as high as 650,000. Uh, of that, about 200 to 210,000 dead, and the rest injured so greatly they'll never return to functionality as soldiers. And so, When we look at the overall cost to Russia, it's not quite so clear that they have the momentum. Again, it is coming at great cost. There is a strain now on allies, and, uh, and there are nations that are undergoing elections and political machinizations that are going to change possibly how they might support Ukraine. And that's probably the most vexing problem that Ukraine faces is, will they have the support in the future that they need? Currently, the West, in my opinion, is giving Ukraine enough supply that they will not lose this war. But the West, again, in my opinion, has made a decision that they are not, not going to give Ukraine what they need to win. Because most Western leaders, in my opinion, again, at this point, are deterred. Mr. Putin's war of intimidation is his most successful war, and he has intimidated the West with his threats of nuclear war and wider war. And so to to my point one last time as I close, the most vexing thing for Ukraine right now is getting the support that I believe it deserves unqualified support such that it can expel Russia from its lands. Right now, 
that is not clear in the future. And uh, Yulia, if I could turn to you, uh, let's zoom out even a bit more for just a moment. Can you go into the various ways in which the Ukraine war has been reverberating around and reordering the surrounding region? I do see in the media how it is being portrayed increasingly that Ukraine is losing and Russia is winning. And I think it's a complicated, uh, complicated equation to calculate. Because if this is the case, and it depends on the interpretation, as we've just heard um, from General Breedlove that really balanced things out a minute ago, it's a matter of Russia is has somewhat of an upper hand, but the loss is not necessarily on Ukraine or on, or on Ukraine's head. It's rather on the West. The West's support for Ukraine is not enough for Ukraine to win, like General Breedlove just said, um, and it is increasingly less for Ukraine to hold. And in that sense, we did in the West make a promise that we would, first of all, support Ukraine for as long as it takes, but we never clarified what it is. And second of all, we did promise uh, that we've heard it from the Biden administration itself, that we will set Ukraine up for success at the negotiation table. And indeed, independent of, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, who is winning the U.S. election, it looks like next year in a form or another, there will be at least talk, if not serious negotiation. But the truth is that we, the West, are not setting up Ukraine for success at the negotiation table um, because we're not giving Ukraine what it needs. And, And it's a bit more complicated even than that, because the problem has been beyond the political decision that General Breedlove was was referring to. It has also been that we, the West, have been trying really hard to not to be in the war. And because we're not in the war, uh, our economies are at peace and not at wartime. So we do not produce enough to help Ukraine. President Zelensky most recently, I think it was a few weeks ago, in an, uh, uh, in an interview with Farid Zaharia for CNN said the ratio of munitions now on the long front line between Russia and Ukraine is 12 to 1. But that's because we're not producing enough because we consider ourselves um, at a time of uh, peace and not of war, indifferent of what General Breedlove just called very, and I really like the term, Putin's war of intimidation that has been really spreading beyond uh, nuclear blackmail and form of espionage and sabotage all across the West, election interference and beyond. If I am to zoom in for a minute into the region, the picture is as complicated as we see it uh, as we see it worldwide. Um, last summer, I was in Georgia asking similar questions. I was in Turkey with my research and in Romania asking similar questions. And though the three countries have very different orientations when it comes to foreign and security policy overall, generally the sense was that um, Ukraine, as supported by the West, is losing and that Putin has the upper hand exactly because the West is not supporting Ukraine enough. If we're looking at election results across the region, because indeed we are going through a major election cycle in the Black Sea region, in and around Ukraine and Central Eastern Europe, across the West, uh, in, in Western Europe, not just in the United States, we see a mixed picture. Just over the last few days, we saw a big win for Putin in Georgia, but we saw a major loss for Putin in Moldova um, just the past Sunday on the 3rd when the second round of uh, of presidential ele- elections were won by the incumbent, very pro-Western president um, of Moldova, Maya Sandu. So it's a mixed picture and people are placing their bets, but right now Ukraine is disabled from winning because of... Uh, a mixed bag, to say it elegantly, when it comes to the West. I will say I'm actually partial to the way that some analysts have been describing the war as five parallel but mutually supporting fronts. We have the land war, particularly in Donbass, the naval war in the Black Sea, 
uh, a strategic standoff war over Crimea and the Russian interior and uh, Russian strikes on Ukrainian cities. Uh, then we have the propaganda or information war and Kiev's and Moscow's competing diplomatic efforts around the world. So arguably, the situation for Ukraine looks different across each of these five fronts. And before we look at them holistically, uh, I wanted to take them one at a time. Uh, General Breedlove, could you give us your assessment of how the war is going for Ukrainian and Russian forces on land, at sea, and in terms of their long-distance strike campaigns? So the land campaign, I think we've discussed already, and that is that there is a slow growth or a slow expansion on the Eastern Front by Russia, and uh, that is a horrible attritional war at great cost to Russia. In Kursk region, uh, Ukraine is holding, but has had to move back in a couple of places in Kursk. And so, um, of course, we now see the introduction of North Korean forces in the Kursk region, which is, uh, is uh, not good in the grand scheme of things, but still Kursk is holding much to Mr. Putin's dismay there. The Black Sea is an entirely amazing picture. Ukraine, without a single capital ship, we use those words to describe major warships, combatants, Ukraine has none, zero. And without a single capital ship, they have all but won the Battle of the North Black Sea in that through their drone warfare, primarily uh, seaborne drones, but also airborne drones, Ukraine has won the battle. Russia is unable to really project power right now in the Northern Black Sea, other than to stay out of range and fire missiles into Ukraine. The air war is a real mixed bag. Uh, Ukraine is having some success uh, at knocking down drones, but uh, the air war is dominated by Russia firing hundreds of missiles and drones every week, sometimes more than 100 in a single night into Ukraine. And this is a particularly disappointing thing for a military officer to watch. If you think of the map of Ukraine, Russia is firing all the way from Belarusian airspace around the east, all the way into the northern Black Sea, into Ukraine. So nearly 300 degrees of attack axis they're firing into Ukraine. They're using missiles from Russia. They're using missiles from Iran. They're using missiles from North Korea. So they're using missiles from all around the world, firing from all points into Ukraine. We in the West do not allow Ukraine to use any Western kit to fire back. We have built sanctuary for Russia. We assure Russia of that sanctuary, and we hold tight against Ukraine using our kit to fire into Russia. It, it is a function of that war of intimidation that we talked about before. We are deterred by Mr. Putin's rhetoric. To their great uh, credit, the Ukrainians are now beginning to build their own indigenous capabilities to fire back into Russia, and they are now slowly taking the fight to Russia. But the policy conundrum of Russia firing from anywhere they want to, with anybody who missiles they want to, and we in the West limit Ukraine from replying with our kit, it is astounding to me that we still hold what I think is an incredibly horrible policy position in this respect. And uh, Yulia, could we get your thoughts on the relative success of the two sides' competing narratives and their global diplomatic efforts? Yeah, and I think with that, you're sort of alluding to the big battle for what some people call the global south, right? Um, and, and that's been ongoing from the very beginning, with uh, Russia essentially waging a propaganda war globally to try to reduce support for Ukraine because that's how Russia can win, right? In the West, um, that's one front, uh, reducing support for Ukraine. And then outside of the West, in what we not very accurately call the global South, kind of putting a bunch of countries into one category, undifferentiated. But 
in the absence of, of a better concept or term, if we are to zoom in on some of these countries and region that we used to call during the Cold War non-aligned, right? That's that's the new global south. Um, then Russia is doing well in that it already had a bunch of tools that it is exploiting. It has ample experience with propaganda wars. It has been practicing, and Mr. Putin has been educated and practicing um, propaganda war for decades now. And if we're looking, for instance, at diplomatic tools until the full-scale invasion, rather, even after 2014, it has been, uh, it has been, Russia uh, that has been helping Ukraine with its diplomatic presence in many African countries. Ukraine has not built out its diplomatic presence across the African continent because um, it has been helped by Russia. And so this is one example of how Russia has the tools to try to gain the upper hand. Um, But it's not just propaganda. There is another aspect that further complicates things, and that is that Russia is also waging a war essentially in Ukraine too, a proxy war against the West. And it has now globalized the West, uh, globalized the war if we're looking at, um, again, sabotage and espionage attempts um, across Europe and, and not only to some extent in the United States as well. But when we're looking at Africa, for instance, and, and beyond, we see Russia uh, supporting directly with intelligence and aid Iran's proxies, giving intelligence to the Houthis, for instance, in Yemen, to target ships that are uh, headed for the European market, essentially increasing the economic war on uh, on Europe, and also working with dictators in uh a belt of coups now uh, in Africa, kicking the West out, including the United States, and pushing migrants through people smuggling into Europe, again, furthering the migration crisis that that, um, the West is facing, uh, particularly when it comes to Europe. These are some examples of Russia using the whole spectrum of tools, not just diplomatic ones, and not just uh, in Africa. These are just some examples in its war against Ukraine. But again, Ukraine is in this instance a proxy for it has become too Western for Russia's liking. That's why um, uh, Moscow attacked um, Ukraine. And it has become a proxy in Russia's war against uh, against the West that it is mostly conducting in a covert manner because it cannot compete with the actual resources and the political will of the West. And hence, it uses covert uh, operations. If I am to assess how it's going, again, it's going pretty well for Russia, Uh, Not because the West doesn't have the resources, but because the West is trying very, very hard to stay out of this war. And it has been driven, as we've discussed many times, including very visibly on the battlefield in its support for Ukraine, by fear of escalation rather than by a strategic vision in how to push and deter Russia, push uh, Russia out and deter it. So I actually want to come back to this uh, question of the internationalization of the war. But uh, before I do, uh, I wonder if you uh, had any thoughts on uh, the Kursk offensive as a uh, info warfare operation in the sense of it being a an embarrassment to Vladimir Putin. Uh, and if uh, it turns out that North Korean troops rather than Russian troops are the ones that need to win back uh Russian territory, what does this mean for Putin standing at home and abroad? All right. So uh, Russia's information warfare in connection to Kursk. To me, Kursk, and I I would love to hear General Breedlov on this um, because he has a a much more close to the military perspective. Um, but, uh, But for me, it has been quite a spectacular move what Ukraine has done. If uh, Ukraine would have gone into Russian territory in 2023, it would have been unlikely to be tolerated by the West. 
Uh, it was not supported by the West, but Ukraine did it anyway, and the West did not react significantly, did not oppose it. If if we would have said two years ago, or if someone would have told me two years ago, Ukraine is going to go into Russia, and no, World War III is not going to break up, uh, break out. Actually, nothing is going to happen other than Russia being humiliated on the on the battlefield. I would have had trouble believing it. And I think a lot of our decision makers would have done the same or would have reacted in the same way. So the fact that Ukraine could demonstrate not just the capacity to uh, take significant parts of Russian territory without an appropriate Russian reaction to it, a slowdown reaction, and now um, enlisting uh, North Korean troops that probably... um, uh, uh, prioritize how to get away from the battlefield faster than than winning on behalf of Russia in a region that they have absolutely no motivation or connection to is quite a thing. World War III has not broken out, and uh, we now know that Ukraine could have taken even more chunks if the West would have let it. Now, there's speculation beyond that what Ukraine wants, if it wants to exchange it um, for a territory that it has lost um, or a true Russian occupation, uh, whether this sets it up better for the negotiation table. But it has broken, and that to me is the biggest, um, the biggest win. Uh, it has broken a taboo, and it has showed the world, not just the West, um, that Russia is much weaker than we would have anticipated, and that Putin is not going to be irrational and escalate um, beyond imagination, that this is and, and remains uh, a conventional war. Let me uh, agree with everything that's been said and just build on it a little bit. Um, I think that I just met with a group of uh, a a delegation from Ukraine this past week. And in a big conversation in front of a large crowd, um, one of the things they pointed out is that, that the West should not be so deterred that Ukraine and the West have stepped over Mr. Putin's red lines many times already in this war, and Mr. Putin has done very little about it. And as Yulia uh, correctly pointed out, this is a prime example of something that we would have thought would have engendered a really tough response, and it has not. I'd like to bring out one point that we as military people talk about, it doesn't play well in the larger public because the subtleties of the argument may not be there. But if you remember a year and a half ago, everybody was talking about the summer offensive. And then the summer offensive didn't work out so well. But what we absolutely know is that the White House as a minimum and other Western powers were really closely limiting what Uh, Ukraine could do in that summer offensive. They weren't going to let them charge off into into Russia and do other things. Instead, they had them just pound straight into the maw of the attritional warfare that was already there. And yes, it didn't work out all that well. And so what we see now is, uh, and I say it a little differently than Yulia did, the the bottom line is Ukraine didn't tell us what they were going to do. And thank God they didn't tell us what we were they were going to do because we would have artificially limited them again because of our fear, our absolute deterred state, we would have said no. And so what Ukraine did instead was they launched their offensive under their terms in their targeted area and their tactics, and they proved to the world that, yes, they can do maneuver warfare, modern maneuver warfare. They built their own form of close air support with drones. They they stepped up the game of electronic warfare in an astounding way, and they had a very successful incursion into Russia. And, uh, and oh, by the way, as Ukrainians have explained to me, this area of curse has a lot of Ukrainian type people living in it, people who see that Ukraine was their home, not Russia. And what a masterstroke in the face of Putin's claims that he's liberating Russians in other countries. 
that Ukraine goes in and liberates a Ukrainian-leaning portion of Russia. So I think there were just a lot of very positive things that come out of this incursion, and I think we should support them to hold the land. Uh, as uh, Yulia noted earlier, uh, from basically the very beginning of the full-scale Russo-Ukrainian war, both sides have sought to internationalize the conflict. And uh, I won't bother going through all the examples of what I mean by this, but uh, very quickly, I mean, Ukraine has pushed to boost the support it obtains from NATO and the wider West. The Kremlin has pushed a narrative to its population that Russia is actually at war with NATO. The Russian blockade of Ukrainian ports created a food insecurity crisis in the Middle East and Africa. Moscow has employed Iranian drones and missiles against Ukrainian cities, and most recently, as we discussed earlier, uh, North Korean troops have joined the front lines. Uh, so, General Rilev, can you comment on how the war in Ukraine fits into the larger global security environment, and what is at stake for the wider rules-based international order here? So I'll probably go in a direction you do not expect here, but let me just make one correction to kind of have the way you phrased your question. I think there is a difference in the way that the two nations have internationalized this war. Not yet, but maybe in the future, but not yet has Ukraine asked for Western soldiers on their battlefields. Russia has been trying to get help because they're in trouble. Another mobilization would be nearly politically disastrous to Mr. Putin, most believe. And so the difference here is, yes, both sides are trying to inter internationalize support, but Russia is starving for manpower from outside of Russia, and Ukraine has yet to come to the West and say, send us your soldiers to fight. Let me take a, a tiny different tact on uh, the latter part of your question. What is, what is clear to me is that uh, I'm often asked when I'm on the, on the road, when we're talking about policy, and I disagree with our, uh, our Ukrainian policy. In fact, most people can't even really state what the U.S. policy towards Ukraine is. They have these little buzz phrases like Yulia talked about earlier uh, in their mind, but none of those are really amount to policy because as Yulia correctly pointed out, they don't tell the world what our objective is. They, it's open sentences that are not closed with the so what of the sentence. But here's what is clear to me. People say, well, what is our Taiwan policy? What is our policy on North Korea? What is our, our policy towards China? And I usually answer in the same way. You can get on Google and get the stated American policy about China and Taiwan. You know, one nation, two systems. Uh, we, we know what the policy is about North Korea. The war is not over. We're at armistice. Uh, and we're going to support the people of the South. So our policies are rather well known, and you can access them rather easily. But that's where I draw the line. Those things are nearly worthless. Your mother probably taught you when you were a child, as my mother taught me. She said, people don't care what you say. They're going to watch what you do. And so I tell everybody that our North Korea policy, our China policy, our Iran policy are all being written on the battlefields of Ukraine. Our support to Ukraine is telling the rest of the world how they will be supported. And what the rest of the world is seeing right now is that you threaten the West and you threaten America with nuclear weapons, and they are going to back up because that's what we've been doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and Ukraine. We are backing up. We are not giving them what they need to win. And so we need to change what we're doing in Ukraine so that people in the world will see that we stand by agreements. And very few Americans, I can't speak for people of other nations, Yulia's home nation, I'm sure, knows this, but very few Americans know what the Budapest Mem Memorandum of 1994 was or said. We were signatories, as you know, with the United Kingdom and Russia to assure Ukraine of its international borders and its sovereignty. And if I was a professor, a great professor like Dr. Joja, 
I would grade the United States F minus on their paper when it comes to the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. So I will close with by saying that, again, we have policies around the world, but they amount to very little when we have a demonstrated policy in Ukraine that shows that we are not very reliable to our commitments. Turning back to you, Yulia, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Other than I entirely agree with General Breedlove, it's really hard for me to add. But let me just um, try to attempt to uh, add maybe one additional layer to the framework he has um, really well laid out. And that is that in our Western denial of the aggression that we see from Russia and others, we are slow in understanding the connections between different battlefields, between different conflicts, and in the essence, in, in essence, the nature of this aggression and of this war. Whether and this has been going on for a couple of years now since the full-scale invasion that I see as almost the epicenter of different conflicts, active or not, that are breaking out around the world that have at core revisionist dictatorships or authoritarian regimes of different nature that are trying to weaken, divide, attack the West. Uh, whether you're talking to uh, students from South Korea, Taiwan, or Japan, or you're talking to leaders um, from these countries and everything in between, they will tell you that their security guarantees and their relationship to the United States as the West's leader depends on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Russia's actions in its cooperation that is increasingly intense with Iran with North Korea, North Korea and with China are telling us essentially the same thing. Uh, whether we're looking now at Ukraine, whether we're looking at um, support for the Houthis, for Hezbollah, for Hamas, for, uh, for other entities, proxies and, and direct and indirect support from these actors, they are targeted at attacking the West for essentially what we stand for. But we're slow in in understanding these connections. We're getting there, but we're slow in understanding these connections. And there is a difference in uh, perception and our self-perception that maybe is at also at the core of this. In reality, and this is the last kind of frame that I'll try to add to this, in reality, the United States is now stronger than it has been in a long time. The military budget and military innovation cannot be compared to any other power around the world. The United States economy is booming compared to any other great power around the world. The United States system or network of allies and partners is stronger and the the gap compared to China and others is bigger than it has been in a long, long time. We are more powerful, in essence, than we have been in a long time. But we don't see the, ourselves like that. And so the world also, whether we're, I was referring to opinions in Georgia, in Turkey, in the region, in Romania, people don't see us the same way uh, because we're not showing this. We're not showing our power and we're not responding uh, uh, resolutely, but rather with fear, fear of escalation, fear of being dragged into a war. And so I think in this lies the essence of the problem. And we will have to see in the next few years, in the next term in the White House and beyond that, whether our leaders will want the United States to remain a great power, the greatest power, or whether we're turning inward so much and are driven so much by what is called, I guess, neo-isolationism, that we are continuing to be deterred by the aggression of much smaller powers such as Russia. Uh, you both kind of anticipated my next question to you. Um, China has all along been playing this role of what I'd like to call an offshore enabler, 
and has been quietly but undeniably supporting Russia's war efforts, but hasn't had to pay much of a cost for this. Uh, so do you believe that there is, in fact, an emergence of a Eurasian axis of anti-Western authoritarian states that would include China, Russia, Iran, North Korea? And uh, if so, uh, how would that fit into this uh, China first US strategy that has become particularly popular in recent years on the American right? General Breedlove, would you like to take a stand on this? Well, I don't know if a stand is where I would go. I would just observe that de facto, yes, there is uh, this grouping of people who all share a disdain for America's approach or the West's approach to the world. They, in their own independence way, see themselves uh, as a very different power uh, vis-a-vis the entire world. Um, and so I think it's there. But I also want to say, and I'm, I'm interested to see how Yulia would react to this, I, I also really believe that this, this grouping of people is not as, uh, as smooth as some would have. First of all, I think that the relationship between China and Russia is not one of brotherly love and and hugging and and wonderful times. I think that China sees Russia as a useful little brother and as a useful person for making money and getting natural resources and so forth. But I I fully see that China also uh, sees Russia as as, uh, not the major player in this agreement. Um, uh, we're all reminded of a couple of years ago when the Chinese general on an open mic moment said, I can march in Russia for months and never see a Russian soldier. You know, there this, this is an interesting arrangement that they have. I also believe that China right now is watching the growing collusion between North Korea and Russia, and that's probably not very happy for China. First of all, if Russia's quid pro quo is to give uh, North Korea increased capability vis-a-vis their nuclear program and rocketry, uh, that would be a threat to China, possibly. And so, you know, I do see these nations as all sharing an anti-U.S. sentiment, but I'm not so sure that the glue that holds this all together is as durable as some would think. Uh, Ilya, are we seeing an alliance of interests or a coalition of convenience amongst these uh, authoritarian states? That's the big discussion. You know, I, I'm I'm currently working on a book that looks at great power or strategic competition, whatever you want to call it. The Democrats call it one thing, the, the Republicans another thing, but it refers to the same thing, looking at Russia, China, and Iran and their cooperation and cooperation patterns rather in the larger Black Sea region as just a case study of what is going on around the world. And over the last two and a half, almost three years through the course of the full-scale invasion, there is no denying of the fact that they have been working very, very closely together and that China has been trying hard to portray itself as a neutral mediator. But uh, thanks to, and here credit to the Biden administration's openness and transparency vis-a-vis um Uh, information, intelligence information that is very important for us to understand, we have uh, now increasing information that shows that China is the main enabler of Russia and cannot be perceived as a mediator. So um, that's one thing. Yes, it's no doubt that they work together a lot. Um, And I too agree, um, like General Breedlove was saying, that China, much bigger than Russia, is likely using Russia as much as it can. Beyond that, I think there's two very brief, or they're big problems, but I, I try to, to I'll try to uh, evaluate them in a very brief manner. One is Europe and China. Uh, Europe is split on on China, and China has major interests in Europe because it is the biggest market in the world. And uh, uh, China needs Europe to sell its goods goods and make money. And Europe is split because it has been investing a lot into China and wants to, to put it bluntly, look the other way 
when in reality China is enabling now directly and indirectly the killing of Europeans in Ukraine, right? Ukrainians are Europeans. And that's one problem that uh, that Europe will have to get its act together um, and, and sort it out with the help ideally of the United States that has been much clearer on China than Europe. That's one thing. And then when we're looking at what can be done from the United States side, the other thing that I wanted to highlight here is I'm a big skeptic of this China first firster attitude because, and I was alluding to that with my observation a bit earlier, the parallel between uh, Asia um, attitudes of or understandings of our partners and allies in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, um, that are saying that the that the theaters, if you'd like, are much more interlinked. It's very unlikely that the United States is just impossible, in my opinion, that the United States will be able to uh, do a hundred eighty degrees change and pull out of Europe to invest everything into Asia, and then will intervene on behalf, including with soldiers in a very risky conflict. If it comes to that, God forbid, will intervene on behalf of Taiwan, Japan, and others in the region, but will remove itself from Europe. That's not possible. In the if the United States wants to remain a global player and to shape the international environment and not let China and others do that, it will have to stay in Europe and it will have to engage more in Asia. You cannot do one without the other and it will have to remain with somewhat of a foothold in the Middle East as well. Um, and so that's why I'm skeptical when it comes to the United States and this China firster attitude that is, uh, uh, that is a part of particularly the Republican Party when it comes to foreign policy, I don't think we can do one without the other. I heard a, a very cute phrase the other day that that I, I like to use. It's fairly uh, simplistic. But yes, we need our eyes up on the horizon to understand what is going on in China and have some sort of a long-term view. But right now, the fire is so close to our feet that it's burning our toes in Europe. Well, I want to be uh, mindful of your time. Uh, so just a final set of twin questions to the both of you. Uh, where is this war headed in 2025? And what can a lame duck Biden administration accomplish in its final months to put Ukraine on a more favorable track before the next US, US administration takes over? Uh, General Breedlove, can we start with you? This war is going to end exactly how Western policymakers want it to end. If we decide that we're going to give Ukraine what they need to win, Ukraine will win. If we do not decide to give Ukraine what they need to win, then it's going to be a long and ugly road. And uh, if, in fact, we get a new administration that wants to end this war in a day, if we comp completely capitulate and give Russia everything that they ask for, and that includes a ceasefire. Russia desperately needs a ceasefire to refit and rearm and get healthy again. If we give them all of that, uh, that will be the third time, 08, 14, and 24, that we would have been, we will have rewarded bad behavior. We will get more bad behavior. And Julia, last word to you. Agree, and it, the risk couldn't be bigger because to me, and we haven't talked about Ukraine's peace plan or victory plan or anything like that, it can be reduced to one thing and one thing only. To me, the 10 points, 5 points, 3 points, you name it, peace plan comes down to Ukraine in NATO or not. We can discuss territories, what can be recovered, what can be frozen, what can be ceasefired, etc. But if we force Ukraine to neutrality in the medium to short term, based on Putin's patterns of aggression, this will mean no good for Ukraine's future, to put it diplomatically, but also for European security as a whole. So the Zelensky administration has been inching towards that. They've done it in a as elegant manner as possible. But in this lame duck period, indeed, President Biden has a choice that he hasn't been 
uh, inching towards visibly, but there is still a chance that President Biden um, will hear Ukraine's calls and will push the alliance, because it is decided in the end in the United States, um, to accept Ukraine or to give Ukraine a clear timeline and deadline for integration, which again will enable Ukraine to successfully negotiate at a negotiation table with Russia if it put, if, if it comes down to it next year. Um, so that for the last remaining months for President Biden and for, uh, and for the next year, it indeed will depend on the outcome of our election here in the United States. Um, but everything uh, is at stake when it comes to Ukraine and when it comes to European security. And we will decide in the United States whether we will have a president that cares about European security and global security worldwide, or one that is um, that is much more reluctant and to, uh, trending towards isolationism when it comes to the United States and Ukraine. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this program, but thank you both for joining. It was a pleasure. Thanks. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in and our podcast production team for all of their work on this week's episode. You can find all of MEI's coverage of the war in Ukraine and its wider implications for regional security on our website at www.mei.edu. You can also follow MEI on X, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Matthew Chekai. Please tune in again next time. 